so this is a, it's a, it's a, very, a fairly short story. And, uh, it's called Robber's Roost. Uh, so anyway, this, this uh, it came to me. This information was conveyed to me a few days ago. So I hope you like this. <clears throat> Have another go, dearie? The nearly besotted young man seemed barely able to lift his head on his flimsy neck after the two tankards of briny tasting ale. Pardon, he managed to get out between liquor bruised lips. Another taste, lovey. Can't leave here without another taste, can we? We, the young man thought, though his brain was also numbed. Who was this blousy enchantress fooling? There would be no we in the direction he was headed. But the dice had been thrown and the answer must be surely I mean, surely not. What exactly was he trying to say? The communication jinxed between mind and mouth. I'll have another, he amended. Chancy, <coughs> roared the Terran angel in a voice that could singe the hairs on a goat's rump. A third tankard for the young gentleman. In accordance with the demand, the hulking black bearded mass behind the bar began to draw a third tankard from a green veined keg. Seems like we should get to know one another a bit better, said the lady of the house, who leaned in closer at the table and gave a pat to one of the young man's thighs. I told you my name is Honeybell. You ain't given up yours yet. The young man shrugged. What's in a name? His voice is becoming more slurred by the moment, his senses more fogged, and dangerously so. Well, how's about letting on what your business is? Seems you're a real worthy gentleman if you get my meaning. Worthy, he asked. Do you mean wealthy? Oh, yes, dearie, she answered as she took the chair at his side and took also his left hand as the right was reserved for lifting tankards. That's just what I mean. The young man rubbed his grizzled jaw three days unshaven and pondered his response. He could smell himself as his last bath had likewise been several days before or was that the lady? Though he was dressed in the finery of an expensive dark blue suit, a pale blue waistcoat, and a white cravat adorned with a small ruby stick pin, he was dusty from the late October road, and he had come many miles indeed to this rustic, nasty hole, rather calling itself a tavern, titled The Traveler's Rest. Wealthy, he repeated. Mm, yes, I suppose I am. Of course you am, said Honeybell whose odiferous aroma was far from the hive and whose grind wheel of a voice if a bell might serve to wake the dead from their graveyard beds. <laughs> Have to be wealthy to be carrying that bag of coins. Chancy, she bellowed over her shoulder. Come on with that ale, our gent's got a thirst. I am in the business of breeding horses, slurred the honored guest. Rather, it's my father's business, but he has put much faith in me to travel to Philadelphia on his behalf. And you journey in alone? My, my, not even a coach and a driver? This brought forth a bemused smile, though it hung crooked on the lip. My father has not made his great fortune by spending money needlessly on what he terms uh, frib, uh, frib, uh, uh, wasteful things, <laughs> such as a coach and driver or passage on a packet boat. Therefore, I am on my own. But hark, I can nearly hear New York town's industry from here. And my business in Philadelphia was quite successful indeed. Glad to hear it, but you know New York town's at least 20 miles further up the pike. Now, if you like, you might spend the night here in a fine, cozy room as it's getting quite chilly out there now that the sun's a goner. Mr. Corbett was the reply to her calls. Matthew Corbett. Matthew, she repeated, and her thin-lipped mouth showed a black-toothed grin. I do like that. <laughs> The age of this person was difficult for Matthew to determine due to the heavy white makeup and blast of red rouge on her face. She might be an elder woman fairly maintained or a younger one gone to blazes. Her thick ringlets of hair were as black as the devil's mercy and her blue eyes gleamed from pockets of what appeared to be silver paint. Her breasts swelled against her bodice like huge white waves about to swamp ships in Manhattan Harbor and her gown, what there was of it, was the indistinct gray color of well-worn age. All in all, Honey Bell was quite a picture, but surely not the one she'd intended to convey. Behind the bar, the bearded Chansey was totally silent, except for a curt nod at the woman's instruction. 
There had been two other men in the place a while ago. They had a tankard apiece and played a few hands of cards and they'd left. But as Chansey lumbered over and set the third tankard of ale on the stained table before the young guest, Matthew's attention had returned to another figure sitting over on the far side, past a hearth where wet wood sizzled and popped and produced more sour smelling smoke than heat or fire. This object of his interest was a slim, beak nosed man who'd been nursing the drink for the past hour and wore a straw hat, a deerskin jacket, brown breeches, and beneath the jacket, a lavender hued waistcoat adorned with silver buttons. He seemed to be looking everywhere except at Matthew, though Matthew knew the man was looking directly at him most of the time. Drink up, dearie, said Honey Bell, lifting the tankard toward his mouth. Matthew caught the hand and lowered it. God help him, the two previous ales had set his head reeling well enough and he had to play this straight. No need to be hasty, is there? I've, I've plenty of time, and as you say, the chill night is not fit for traveling. Right enough, was her energetic answer. Get yourself a room upstairs. <coughs> Head off to New York town bright and early. Matthew nodded. He stirred the ale with her forefinger. Hmm, he said idly. He's speaking to himself. This liquid seems thicker than the others. Oily, I'd say. Is it? Probably because it comes from near the keg's bottom. Got more kick in it, I reckon. More kick was certainly correct, <coughs> Matthew thought. The third ale. That was the one that knocked me under, said Burton Gary in the office of the Herald Agency at number seven Stone Street several days ago. A few sips of it, and the next thing I knew, I was waking up laid out in the woods with the dawn light coming up, my money bag and pocket watch stolen, my boots and my waistcoat stripped from me, and my horse nowhere in sight. Needless to say, the Traveler's Rest Tavern was nowhere to be seen either. How far they took me before I was dumped, I can't say, but I suppose I'm quite fortunate they didn't brain me at the, on the spot. I agree, said Matthew, who was alone for a few days, since Catherine Harold had gone to England, and Hudson Greathouse was all trying to recover Lady Edith Parkman's stolen prize Doberman. I'm uh, uh, sorry, Dal Dalmatian. <laughs> Reel it back. Reel it back. <laughs> Dalmatian. <laughs> I have some experience with dangerous trap tavern keepers, he went on. You might consider yourself lucky indeed that this group of robbers aren't necessarily killers. The sandy-haired visitor to number seven was about 40 years old, a medium build, had a rather sad-eyed face, understandable due to the circumstances, and an air of both pent-up anger and righteous frustration. When I got myself up off the ground and the world stopped spinning, he said, I walked six miles before I found a seat on a passing hay wagon. I slept in a barn that night and at daylight walked another four miles and I reached a tavern where they expected a coach bound for New York. Of course, I had not a shilling to my name, so what was I to do? What did you do? I begged, Gary admitted, and I promised that my friend in New York, Silas Jensen, would pay twice the fare. Silas happens to be a money lender, said Matthew. Yes, I know the man. Well, Gary continued, my coachman, the coachman agreed to three times the fare, and I was given the ride. <clears throat> Silas paid and also graciously afforded me the suit I'm wearing. As I told you, I own two boot-making shops in Philadelphia, and I'm planning to open another here. But Mr. Corbett, those scoundrels should not get away with this affront. They even stole not only my new horse, but a fine silver button waistcoat from Paris that was a birthday gift from my wife. I suggest you see our high constable, Gordon, uh, Gardner Lillehorn, to aid you in this matter. To this, Gary gave a rather frightening scowl. Silas and I went to see him first thing. He says he can do nothing, that he's heard a similar complaint a few weeks ago and it also concerned a drug of some kind and a third tankard of ale. He says there's no law out there where there's, those robbers thrive and he has more than enough work to trouble him here. Can you believe that? I certainly can knowing him, but what can I do for you? You can at least get my horse back for me. My God, is there no justice to be found here? Matthew thought about it. How on earth was he to march into a robber's roost and demand the return of a victim's horse? No one possible. And he was about to say the same when he paused. Hudson had said, don't accept anything until I get back. But here was really the first problem Matthew faced since being introduced into the agency. Was there a way to march in there and get the horse returned? No, impossible. But still, was there? It would certainly go a long way to secure his future with the agency. Of course, if he was killed, it would be a short trip. <laughs> but were these varlets killers? It seemed not. Perhaps that was just wishful thinking. 
Don't accept anything until I get back. And Hudson had added his favorite term of derision, <laughs> moonbeam. <laughs> <laughs> then came the three words that Matthew knew he should not utter, but perhaps his own inflamed sense of worth compelled him to say, I will try. Thus, on this October Eve, he sat nearly stupefied in the company of Honey Bell, Chansey, and the straw-hatted, stolen, waistcoated man who was likely the leader of this group, with a third brogue tankard at hand and a borrowed bag of gold coins from Silas Jansen that Gary had arranged. And as a cold matter of fact, at the moment, he very much doubted his dumb idea of both justice and wisdom. Drink up, Matthew, said Honey Bell, with a smile that edged toward a sneer. Oh, you're a handsome one, you are. I, I feel woozy, Matthew answered. Pardon me if I step out to get some air. And let the coal latch in your lungs? She put a hand on his arm and tightened it. Folks have died that way. Well, he felt sweat in his hands. Let me just stand up. Oh, my head's swimming. He pulled loose with an effort and got to his feet. He noted also that the straw-headed gent stood up. It was evident he was not getting out the door. Let me just put my face against the window glass, and cool off a bit. Oh, that'll do, I suppose. I'll hold on to you and keep you from stumbling. Come on, man, to the window with you. With the woman leaped to him and the two men watching with hawk-like eyes, Matthew did stumble his way to the nearest window. He pressed his face against the glass with the cold night beyond cool, head clearing it away, and drew a white handkerchief from a pocket to mop his forehead and cheeks. There you go, said Honey Bell, her voice lower now, but carrying a sharper edge. All right, dearie, back to the table. Let's finish that drink. Then you can have a nice long rest up in a soft bed. Lean on me. I'll help you home. <laughs> home was certainly where he wished to be. But in another moment, he was returned to that damn chair at that damn table with that damn third tankard awaiting his lips. And what was to be done with that? Matthew lifted the drink and brought it toward his mouth, paused again, and the candlelight of the ugly tavern, he saw Honey Bell's silver shaded eyes shining like demon lamps. Her tongue flicked out, tasting gold coins. Quite suddenly, Matthew no longer had to concern himself with a tincture of opium or whatever soporific drug had been added by Chansey to the third tanker. But the door was kicked open. Wham! And the noise knocked Honey Bell right out of her chair. In from the night stalked a huge black guard figure, black tricorn pulled low, leather mask over it up her face, and black kerchief around the lower, and ebon cloak pulled around the shoulders, and in black gloved hands, a blunderbuss that looked as dangerous as a small cannon. Nobody move, the man growled. The voice sounded as as rough as splintered wood and as mean as a constipated bear. <laughs> Just stay nice and still and nobody gets hurt. To this, Honey Bell gave a little garbled shriek. She was on her knees and she lifted trembling hands in a manner of surrender. What the hell is this? demanded Sir Straw Hat. This, came the reply, is where everybody empties their pockets and puts the money in here. He, he touched a black leather bag hanging from a thick shoulder. You! The blunderbuss turned upon Matthew. Cuff it up, boy. A robbery? Straw Hat sounded incredulous. You're robbing us? <laughs> That's the name of it, Twinkle. <laughs> Twinkle, oh yes, Matthew had seen the gleam of a silver tooth in Straw Hat's mouth. We don't have no money. Through Chancey's beard came a voice that sounded as high as a frightened schoolboy's. Now that's not what I've been hearing, the blunderbuss being impartial aimed at Chansey. Me and my gang here, this was a real robber's roost. But you better start finding the loot real quick. I don't have no time to dawdle. Your gang, Straw Hat now also sounded a trifle terrified. What gang? The hammer fist, you asshole. <laughs> We're taking charge of all hereabouts. The loot, I said. Money and we burn this place to the ground. He's got money, Honey Bell pointed at Matthew, a bag of coins. Music to my ears, the man's boots pounded across the boards until the blunderbuss was under Matthew's chin. All right, rich boy, give it up. Listen, I, the blunderbuss's deadly barrel pushed against Matthew's nose. Without another word, the bag of gold coins was dropped into the open leather bag. 
I'll have those two fancy drawers, said the villain who abruptly and roughly wrenched the cravat with his ruby stick pin off Matthew's neck. It followed the other wealth into the bag. You can't come in here and rob us, Straw Hat said, showing a weak flame of courage. We'll fetch the law on you. Ha! The robber laughed, a terrible noise. Ain't no law but me and my gang to hammer claws around here. Matthew's eyes widened a bit. Hammer fists or hammer claws? The, the robber should at least remember the name of his own gang. <laughs> but it flew over the heads of everyone else, particularly when the robber shouted, Money now! And fired the blunderbuss, an ear-cracking explosion that blew the bar's keg apart and set streamers of ale flying through the air. There was a flash of crimson lining from within the cloak. And suddenly the robber was holding a cock pistol, which he chose to aim at Straw Hat. Straw Hat! God's mercy! cried the targeted scoundrel, who threw up one hand and with the other started digging coins out of his breeches. A little patch of coins came out from between Honeybell's breasts. Chancey reached under the bar. Careful there, you bearded toad, was the admonition. And he came up with a clay jug, the contents of which dingled like a chorus of little chimes. Out poured the coins to the bag. And then the robber said with obvious lip-smacking satisfaction, Nice horse out front and two more in that corral out back. I'm taking them all. Any objections? None was given. Hear me, said the robber, who rubbed his nose under the cloth with a pistol's barrel. I don't want to play dirty, but this is how it's going to be. You got yourself a reputation here. If you stay in this location, which me and my boys are now claiming, you can keep on doing what you will, but you're going to be giving us half of what you get your paws on. And if we think you're selling us short, we'll skin you alive and burn you to ashes with this damn hole. So from now on, you're keeping a ledger what you get. And it better be true, because we'll be watching you. And we'll be coming in here to get a drink or two, and you'll never know the if of it. He started backing toward the open doorway, fireplace smoke swirling in his wake. Think on that, and you best better think kindly on it. Matthew had to speak up, though he felt like falling down. Please, sir, don't take my horse. How will I get back? Shut up, came the reply like a saw blade on rusted iron. Go cry to your mama. He stopped in the doorway. Anybody comes out in the next 15 minutes, they get to tell the devil how they got shot through the brain pan. Then he gave a little bow. Good night, all, he said, and he was gone beyond the light. Silence reigned. And the travelers rest. Silence and more silence. Until Straw Hat cried out through a strained throat. We gotta back up and get the hell out of here. <laughs> Honey Bell began to sob. And Matthew felt a little sorry for her, but not by much. What am I going to do? He asked the group. How am I going to get home? Honey Bell's sobbing became a sodden snarl. Who the hell cares? Get out of here, you damned, you damned pauper. Which at the moment... Matthew Corbett really was. They began rushing about like headless chickens. Has it been 15 minutes? Matthew asked, but no one answered. He drew in a long breath, pulled his own cloak about his shoulders, and left a wretched place with this wretched inhabitant scurrying about gathering up whatever they wished to take with them on their forthcoming voyage to China. Matthew walked along the road in the dark, the breeze cold in his face. Some night this has been, at least he'd been spared the third tankard. He walked on and on, trudging across the coach-rutted dirt with a wild forest on both sides. He figured he'd made at least half a mile before he came across the robber, who sat astride his own horse with the other animals tied behind an equine parade. One of them surely belonged to Burton Gary, so that was that. How'd I do, Hudson asked, <laughs> grinning now that they, the mask and kerchief cloth were removed. <laughs> You need to work on your command of English, Matthew said, though I presume you were speaking their language. And I thought when I signaled you through the window that I had the third tanker that you weren't coming in just to spike me. Also, why did you make me walk half a mile to get to? <laughs> I should have made you walk two miles, doing exactly what I said you should not do while I was gone. Damn it, Matthew, that could have been a real mess. But it was not, said Matthew as he swung himself up on the Subi saddle. Was it? Hudson had finished his work for Lady Parkman, had delivered the ransom, and returned the Dalmatian unharmed. On his way into the office, he'd ask, Who was that sad eyed gent I passed on the stairs? And so. 
On the ride back under a starry sky and a yellow half moon, Hudson said, well, I suppose you did the right thing. I mean, asking me to help. I won't hold it against you. I'm glad to hear it. I haven't asked in all our planning, but I also suppose that whoever stole Lady Parkman's dog has been sent to justice. Justice, Hudson repeated. And he was quiet for a while. Then I followed him to a farmhouse after he picked up the money bag. I burst through the door, planning to break his arms. <laughs> Inside, I found a young man, a young wife, and two small children, and poverty there as well. Seems the young man used to work for Lady Parkman until she fired him for bringing his children to play with the dog one afternoon. Said she didn't want their dirty hands on him. To Hudson's subsequent silence, Matthew ventured, you let him keep the ransom money, didn't you? I told Lady Parkman I lost him in the dark. She said she wouldn't pay me one shilling for work I did not complete. Hmm, Matthew said. I didn't realize you were the sentimental type. Oh my gosh, hang on, hang on. I may have to do this from memory. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> Well, yes. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> Saved. <laughs> and the world rejoices. <laughs> Thanks, world. <laughs> hmm, Matthew said, I didn't realize you were the sentimental type. I'm not. And if you say anything about this to Catherine, I'll make a moonbeam see stars for a solid week. <laughs> anyway, Hudson said, and you made the leather bag jingle and jangle, musical with its booty. I think we made out tonight like Roberts, don't you? <laughs> well said, Matthew replied. Very well said. They both had to, had to laugh in the quiet night. And their laughter followed them all the way home.